This conference will now be recorded. Okay, from now on, uh, we are being recorded, and the tape will be available for anyone that wants to listen to it on the ANCAN website. Today is January 16th. I'm John. This is the uh, high risk metastatic advanced prostate cancer support group for ANCAN. Um, we'd like to acknowledge a number of uh, sponsors who I have lost track of. Can you, Rick? I can do it, yes. With Pfizer, please. I'd be happy to. Pfizer, Bayer, Janssen. You'll have to excuse me. I have a house guest and he's lost. Oh, go be ahead. Right. Okay. Now, um, there's only one person here that's brand new. Uh, am I correct about that, Dana? And that's it? Okay. Let me give you a little introduction, Dana, although Peter probably already has. Uh, Peter must have brought you to this group because of the several different uh, prostate cancer and other groups at ANCAN. This is the one that you're the best fit for. It sounds like you're there with uh, a couple of family members as well, which are always welcome to this group. We meet from 8 to 10 Eastern time. And uh, usually we start out with the new person to uh, let them introduce themselves, uh, tell us what they're looking for, what questions that they have. And, uh, but uh, that's, completely optional. If you want to just listen for a group or for an hour, you're welcome to do that. Uh, would you like to go through a little introductory interview with me or would you like to wait? Wait. Okay. Hi there. Uh, Hi. This is... Um. Was that harmony that I just heard? Yes, sir. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to collect myself a little bit. That's um, okay. Take, take, take your time. My um, dad, um, my dad doesn't think that he can be on the call tonight. Um, he's in the hospital tonight, which was just kind of an acute change. And, um, okay. we still wanted to, we still wanted to call in to, to see what else we could learn from you all. Okay. So I appreciate your time. Um, that, but... That's fine, Harmony. So let, 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 me, let me do this and we'll come back to you. Um, we, we can come back to you. you feel free to listen. Um, can you share with, because I know the background, I can just give the guys a, a, a quick introduction and tell them and then we'll, we'll move on. But um, can you can you tell us what's taking your dad into the hospital tonight? Yeah, he um, yesterday he got short of breath at home, and um, a, uh, they went and got a home pulse ox, and his pulse ox rating was in the in the high seventies, low eighties. So he went to the emergency room, and okay. for whatever reason, he's developed some congestive heart failure, which he's hasn't had. Um, oh and he's only been on that, on the, uh, um, on the anti hormone medicine for only about four doses now. So they're not really sure why it happened. This has acutely happened. On what medicine yeah. for four doses, Harmony? So, uh, so he, he's been on bicalutamide and we're trying oh, to get oh, okay. him we're going to trying to get him switched over to Orgovix. And I definitely think at this point, the VA needs to put him on. Or if it were me, I mean, we can't give you medical advice, but given those symptoms, it's an even bigger reason that he should be on the Orgovix harmony. And, and, right. And you know, I, I was reading through the Orgovix and just to give you some history on me a little bit, I, not that it matters, but I am a, nurse so weeding through some of this medical information is you know i've definitely done a lot of it in my career but i i haven't been able to talk to his oncologist because of the weekend and whatnot but okay. the 
Orgovix, I, I wonder if they didn't put him on that because my dad has a history of arrhythmias and he's on two different medications for arrhythmias. And it looks like with the Orgovix, there's definitely some risk of like prolonged QT and some other other arrhythmic issues. And I, so I haven't been able to ask them yet if that's, you know, if they wanted to switch to that or if that, that was the reason why they didn't recommend that initially. But that's to be well, determined hopefully soon. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned to me that he was on bicalutamide and he was going to get a Lupron shot in 30 days. Yep, he he started the bicalutamide on Thursday and he will get a Lupron shot on this coming Thursday. And he'll right. be on the bicalutamide for 30 days. Right, so let, let, me, let, me explain, let, me, let, let me explain to you. He sure. takes the Orgovix, he doesn't take the Lupron, and he doesn't take the bicalutamide. Correct. The Orgovix replaces both of those. Yes. So if he's on the bicalutamide, I, I doubt very much that he would be on the Orgovix. It's not impossible because it's an old protocol where they use both a second line anti, a first line antiandrogen and Lupron, um, but they rarely do that today. So my right. guess is that, 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 that the androgen deprivation meds that he's oh. using are not um, are, are not related to the um, to whatever the, whatever is going on right now is not attributable to what is. Um, what's going on but rather than take the time and these guys are in the dark you know, right. please feel free to come back next tuesday yeah. and you know you need to straighten it out with the with the medical oncologist and the va yes okay where do yes. you where do you live harmony colorado oh okay okay Okay, so, well, sit, sit in if you want or or wait till next week, uh, whatever you want to do. And it sounds like you already have a contact with uh, Rick and Peter. Yes, thank you if, much. If you, if you need us during the week, right? Yes, thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, you do. So, now, jo Rick, Dr. John, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I apologize for what happened before, but I have a have a house guest staying with me and he was having trouble finding his way back to the house and getting inside, but he's in and that's all good. So I, I was mentioning the sponsors. I'll just pick up there and then we can resume. So our sponsors are um, Bayer, Pfizer, Janssen, um, and we've recently added Myovant and Myriad. Uh, Foundation Medicine has been a long time sponsor, although they don't specifically, they sponsor us across the board, uh, not specifically these groups. And um, I think those are right now the only people. So, and if you want to see, if you look on, if you look on the bottom of our reminder, you'll find it. Now, tonight we welcome uh, Sophia Sotelo, who works with Myriad, who's one of their patient, um, one of their um, patient organization liaisons, and we're kind of new to with, with Myriad, although they've known us and we've known them for a long time. And um, as most of you are aware, Myriad makes a, um, a genetic and now somatic testing as well as genetic testing so for a long time they've made a germline test um similar to the to to what you would get if you applied for the promise test um more often it's ordered by the by docs than 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 than, than by individuals but not always and they recently introduced a um somatic test which is it includes rna and dna and we have not yet seen the report that's put out. We don't have any experience with it yet, but it may be a test that we would, would come to mention along with tests like um, FMI and, uh, and Karras and uh, Tempus and 
um, th th those are the three normally that, that we 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 talk about. Um, there are others too. So with that, Sophia, is there anything would you like to say hello to all these gents um, and and um, anything else you'd like to add? We can see your mic is open, but we can't hear you. So still can't hear you. One thing you might want to do is just make sure that um, on this application, uh, in your settings, the correct microphone is selected because it may have defaulted to another microphone. Are you there? All right, well, well, we'll try you in a little bit. See if maybe you, know, you might want to go out, come back in again, check your settings, but we'll give you, um, we'll surely be happy to provide you with some time and we thank Myriad very much for their sponsorship. Um, and we'll talk to you when we can hear you. Okay, thank you for your message. Sophia so, just uh, uh, messaged us to say she's going to try to re-sign in and see what happens. Uh, okay, um, well, excuse me just a second. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know who's next on the list. Are you back? I'm back. I'm back, and we got a couple of people that didn't, we didn't get to last week. And one of them is Pat Martin. Let's start with you, Pat. Will do. Um, I started uh, Dosa Taxa last week uh, uh, the afternoon, and I was accepted into a steady uh, double blind random rise. Nobody knows who's getting what, but it's for it's uh, Kappa Vassar Tib or Cappy. Um, and I'm taking two pills twice a day along with the dose of Taxol that I got an infusion, like I say, last Thursday. The um, dose of Taxol, I'll do um, six sessions, uh, three weeks. Of, every three weeks, I'll get a an infusion, and I'll be taking the cappy uh, two a day. And then I'll do four days on, three days off, four days on for all time. And so um, it's a drug that um, instead of trying to kill the cells, it keeps them from multiplying. And so it has a different attack mechanism than dosi because dosi, if I understand it right, tries to kill the cell outright. Anything that's rapidly reproducing yeah. anyway other than that that's now might, might you be on placebo you don't know or are you for sure There's, on the yes. nobody knows they say nobody knows so okay yeah it's a it's a double blind placebo okay. and read through the literature after i get done with my sessions of dosal taxol um, I can have the option of continuing on and actually going to the CAPI, um, even if that's not what I've been getting. So we'll see. It's, that'll be what made you there. eligible for this study? Uh, I had metastatic cancer. Uh-huh. Yeah, there Met wasn't. And, um, yeah, that was the main qualifier. Hormone sensitive, hormone resistant, or either way. Hormone resistant. Um, okay. It's um, castrate resistant, metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. Okay. I've got a tumor about the size of a prostate, close to a intestine. Uh huh. So even with the uh, the former. Um, drug I was taking, my PSA was doubling every month, and uh, not only was the numbers going bad, 
but they took two scans a few weeks apart and uh, there was only minimal um, shrinkage in some of them and quite a bit of uh, enlarging in all, most of them. So they took me off the, gee, I can't even remember what it is, um, an Im immunotherapy, the same one that, uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. I can't remember your name. <laughs> Peter, Peter. Oh, <laughs> anyway. Pembrolizumab, Keytruda. Yeah, Keytruda. Oh, Keytruda. Yeah. So that's where I'm at. And it sounds like I'll be there for uh, for a while. Are you symptomatic? Well, I got a lot of pain in my body and they keep asking me, is it uh, cancer associated? How do you know? I, I don't know. Um, so a lot of aches and pains. Um, like I say, I've got one uh, inch and three quarter tall, inch and a quarter wide, uh, very close to one of my uh, large bowel. And I think it's messing up even my bowels, uh, even though the radiologist said, oh, no, there's a gap in between. I I don't know. He might be I right. See. So do, do you have to, was this a hard decision? Do you have to give up any standard treatment? Uh, no. That you would... No, standard treatment, standard of care right now would be docetaxel. Okay. And so they, um, Fred Hutch um, put me on docetaxel and offered this as a uh, side by treatment. See if it's a um, set of pills that AstraZeneca out of England puts out. And the so study. I here, have a I have a couple of questions for you, Pat. Okay. First of all. Um, if you have the trial number, um, yes, I do. Be good enough, if you'd be good enough to type it into the chat window for the Brains Trust, because I'm sure they would like to, to to take a look. That that would be the easiest way to do it. You you can okay, do it after. I've I've got uh, four numbers. I've got a protocol study, uh, HSD number study. And an NCT number. That's it. That's the number. That's the number. The NCT number. Okay, I'll type it into the thing. So okay, we're uh, when we're done. Secondly, it sounds to me, and I, again, I'll defer to the Brains Trust, but it sounds to me this is what they something like an anti-angiogenetic drug. In other words, it 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 aims to stop the the cancer multiplying um whether it does it in an angiogenetic fashion or not i don't know but that means angiogenetic means um developing new blood vessels and and which is what cancer does cancer cancer feeds itself and creates new blood vessels so anti-angiogenetic drugs and there are a number of them um, hone in on stopping the cells from making new blood vessels so they can't grow anymore. Okay. And I, I'm not familiar with capovacitib. Um, is it approved for any other cancers yet, or is this brand new? Um, I think there's, in studies, there's it's being used on others, I, I think. I just concentrated on the prostate end of it. Um, yeah, I, I can't answer that, right? So any any other, any, does the Brains Trust want to comment on this at all? Any familiar? Ben once, or, I uh, once I figure out how to spell it, I'll look it up. <laughs> I, I'll get that. <laughs> and for those of you who are not familiar, the chat window is the top. In the top right, there's a little square question mark, question bubble. 
um, a square bubble. And if you click on that, there um, are things in the, uh, there are some things to everyone already in there and you'll, you'll see a note from Herb amongst other things. And, Okay, capavacitib, I think. I have it as C-A-P-A-V-A-S-E-R-T-I-B. That's probably close enough. Excuse me, Herb, but that's probably close enough for government work. Yeah. It doesn't look okay. like it's an approved drug for something else. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, anybody have any questions or discussions about this? Because this whole business of uh, joining a study uh, might be in the future for many of us. It's definitely in the present and the past for many of us. Any discussion? Pat, can you tell me again why they took you off, Katruda? It, it wasn't working. Um, what, what do you mean by wasn't working? Huh? What do you mean by wasn't working? My PSA went from about 1.5 to 5.78. And, and on the scans, that's, that's not enough. But on the scans, only a few, very few of the metastases that were lit up did not light up. Uh, I think five weeks later, and some of them were were more than doubled. Uh, how, how, like long period, what, how long a period was was were you on the Katruda? How many how many I, infusions? Uh, I think I took four doses of it. Okay. Yeah, and it just um, the rate it was growing, the rate my cancer was growing, they didn't feel like it was. Uh, worth following in. Although they said once I get through this docetaxel and, and any other study, they might put me back on and go with the Petruda. Okay. You know, I know I know we've talked. I told you it took me um, over three doses, several months before mine kicked in. And Len, yeah. Len sent me a Len sent me a a um, presentation by a man who, who went quite a bit longer before it kicked in. So that's, that's they they know that though, that it often takes a while for Katruda to start working. So I'm glad they haven't totally shut the door on it. Yeah, no, no. Dr. Schweitzer is very, um, he, want, he wanted me on Katruda because of my MSI high and right. he thought it was gonna be real good for me but it just didn't show any efficacy. Okay. So Let's keep can I just come back for a second to the, to the anti-angionetic drugs? So there are a couple of very famous ones um, that probably some of you have heard, and we've tried them in prostate cancer before, but they haven't really worked. So Avastin is one, uh, Cometric is another. I'm just, these are the commercial names. Um, Affinitor, Revlimid, um, and the trials to date for these, we, we've not, we've never seen um, too much luck. So whatever this um, cabavacitib is, um, it's of, the, the, there must be something in it. I don't know what, but there must be something in it that, that distinguishes it from, from, um, from the drugs like Avastin. Okay. Yeah, I've got a 30 page book that reading through it and then I've gone through it several times. And uh, I don't re remember any of the particulars. Yeah, my, my, uh, my curtain mate uh, at the infusion center <laughs> last Thursday, a friend of mine, He's doing a Vastin with uh, his docetaxel and carboplatin, but um, because it was a Vastin, he he was there. I I met him at two o'clock. He'd been there since eight in the morning, and uh, oh, wow. finished finished at four. So even though it's a blind study, you might uh, if you're there for a long time, it, it's getting infused. 
it might be a tip off that you're getting a real deal. No, this yeah. this is a these are pills, Peter. Oh, it's pills. Yeah, they're two pills twice a day. Okay. No, but I was there. I was in Seattle Cancer Care in the infusion. One day I went in at about eight fifteen and got out about four o'clock, and the next day I went in about nine o'clock and got out uh, after six o'clock in the evening. So I got to know the building very well. Okay. Peter, is, is, is this person, your curtain mate, what, what cancer is he being treated for? Uh, right now he's being treated for the lung cancer. Okay. The prostate. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, anybody, Dr. John. Anybody else on this topic? There was, uh, there was another person that was waiting last week and didn't get to speak. That I Larry Fish. Oh, it's Larry Fish. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Larry? Yeah. Hi, John. Uh, hi. Last Monday was, my, was the end of my uh, SBRT. I had five sessions to the prostate just to ablate, but there was new growth there, and uh, three sessions to thoracic 66. Uh, I have side effects, but they seem to be now. In the beginning, I had a little surprising side effects, and was curious how others have uh, been through kind of double SBRT sessions. But now it seems to be subsiding a little, and I'm, I guess I haven't that much to say. It's like uh, I'm still on Lupron. I didn't stop it, and darolutamide. Um, okay, I guess. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm scheduled for seeing my get blood tests and checkups after a month. Uh, I think that's kind of they want to give it a few more weeks to keep working or developing. And I wonder just if anybody else had any uh, like longer range or side effects that happen later on down the road, or if things are going normal for me, luckily. That's it. Any questions or comments? Anybody else? I, uh, um, uh, Larry, I had, uh, I had SBRT. Um, I think two, uh, two years ago now, and I did have side effects during the treatment period, which was uh, five or six treatments over over uh, five or six weeks, and had some side effects then. But after that, uh, it's been clear sailing in terms of side effects. No incontinence whatsoever, uh, which has been great. And um, you know, just it's, I I'm, I really feel my SBRT uh, was a success. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I'm not. Um, I'm pretty tired in general. I can't do very much. Um, but they said that was expected for two to four weeks. So it's been a week. I'm starting to feel a little more energetic. And uh, they gave me Flomax for polyuria for urgency, um, which I really was experiencing during the treatment. And still it's dwindling. Uh, disappearing back to its usual polyuria. And then uh, a little bit of burning and achiness, not much. Some diarrhea. Uh, I don't think it uh, created any big problems. You do sound a little tired to me. Well, I I had a long day so far. I well. up to five and driving four hours. Oh. That's bad. I'm a little tired. Yeah. Um, Larry, when we talked, um, when I spoke to you after the meeting last week, did we, did we talk about possibly sequencing your cancer again? But when was, the, when was the last time it was sequenced? They don't have something to sequence. You want to? You mean by a spit test? Um, okay. There's nothing that can say. Yeah. Uh, 
one biopsy that I had and went to the urologist where I knew what was going on. Um, could not get anything to follow up on. And <laughs> my oncologist has said she's waiting for something she can grab. <laughs> right. <laughs> That hasn't right. really happened yet, and I'm not letting things grow to that point. And I certainly wasn't gonna during the radiation. They're just doing X-rays and ultrasound and everything. They're not uh, testing something that can produce um, information about the cancer itself. And before it, I had that pyloric, pyloric, uh, pyloric, uh, pyloric. Uh, and that's what identified these close whack a mole sort of and took the opportunity to play the process. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's I remember now that's what you said to me last week. And you, and your uh, PSA is still really low, right? Yeah, it's pretty low. It's like zero point seven right now, which is pretty good. It had been zero point to- 0. 0.7? 0. 0.07. Oh, 0. 0.07. Yeah, that's that's very low. So uh, that's up to 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7. Oh. So before, the dar- before the darolutamide, which really brought it down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay, and you, and, and you are, and didn't you tell me you, you've upped your dose a little bit on... Um, on um Darrow. Darrow Ludamide. Yeah, I had was taking, you know, four pills a day two and two, but I got really bad side effects from the one I took in the morning at the work. So we decided to cut that down to three pills a day. And then I had COVID and I had some other issues and then I was starting to go for the radiation preps. So I myself cut it back to two a day and it's got a little eyes and PSA was out. So now I'm back on three a day and trying four a day, but I, four a day doesn't work well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Sophia, you want to try again and see if you have a live mic and say hi? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, you did it. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. But I just wanted to take some time and just say, you know, thanks for having me on. Um, Like Rick said, I'm from Myriad Genetics. And as he mentioned, we specialize in genetic testing to help men like yourselves personalize your prostate cancer treatment. Uh, And this is the first year that we are partnering with ANCAN. So we're really excited about that and appreciate the time to be able to listen in on your experience so that we can better gain insights on how we can better improve our offerings and help men in similar situations. And so I'll be here to help answer any high level questions that you may have about genetic testing in general. Thank you. So we we, we have a number, Sophia, we have a number of men. I mean, I I, I don't know. we can't really do a show of hands because unfortunately um, I think we only have 25 videos, but um, I would guess that almost every man on, on this call has had s- some type of testing, either genetic mm-hmm. or, um, or either germline or somatic. And That's great to hear. Yeah. Well, let me do it the other way. Is, is there anybody on this call who, um, I know M- Michael Wynn that may be an exception, but is there anybody with, with advanced disease on this call who has not had any type of testing, either inherited germline or somatic testing? Alan? Anyone else? You can put your you can put your your screen on if if you're uh, but I, you know, I, ah, Jimmy has, Jimmy, Jimmy's no, Jimmy hasn't had any testing. So y- you can see, but if we were to ask Jimmy about what does he know about germline or, or somatic testing, he could probably talk to you for, for the next 20 minutes because he hears it all the time. So what's more interesting is we have a couple of men on this call who have 
have their treatment directed by testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I think that most of our guys are pretty much aware um, of the use of, 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 of right. ge certainly germline and, and, and most of them are aware of somatic testing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, you know, that's very good to hear, you know, that there is a push at, for genetic testing and, you know, that we're out there and you're seeing the importance of it. Yeah. Great. Well, if any guys, if, we, if something comes up, we have questions for you. We'll, uh, I'll be we'll here. Be, well, hang in, you'll be here. Go on. No. Okay. This is all, this is all great to hear. Thank you. Uh, Mike Yancey, you're, you still here? I'm still there here. You, oh, there you are. I see you. Okay. Uh, um, I have a question for Sophia. Oh, go ahead, Larry. Uh, are there, are they thinking that they can start to do somatic testing without, uh, Yes. Yeah, so, uh, at, Myri at Myriad, we have just launched a new, uh, somatic test and it's called precise tumor that is now available. And you need to have tissue for that, or is it possible to do that from blood or it, from... It, it is a tissue test, yes. Oh, okay. That's what I wanted to know if anything was starting to not require it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and you know the, the, the problem with the with the um, with the blood tests, the liquid tests, is that you've gotta have a fairly decent tumor burden in order to, for that um, test to yield anything. Otherwise they can't get enough DNA out of the blood to do the analysis, Larry. So, um, and so, you know, those liquid tests are available right now from yeah. a number of people. But if, when your PSA is as low as yours, um, it, it's, we're not going to see anything if we do it. And we've had guys that have done it and they don't get a result. Yeah. That's what I was thinking where we're still at. Thank you. Back to you, Mike. Okay. Well, uh, I just want to give you another update. I gave you an update a couple of weeks ago and I had talked about having you know, pain in the hips and the shoulders after I'd finished uh, my, my number four, Provicto. Of yeah. course, there was a couple of others on the call that uh, also brought up some of that similar conversation. And so there was some, at least at that point, some initial thought that maybe that was a side effect. But in my case, I now come to the conclusion that is not the case. Uh, my numbers have all looked good. My PSA has dropped from 0.66 in October to 0.17 this week. And my cancer does not put out a whole lot of PSA. So that's something that uh, you just kind of use it as a, as a guideline and of course my alkaline phosphatase also is close to the normal range so that's still slightly high but down considerably so uh with respect to that pain i reported on a couple of weeks ago i had five sessions of radiation on hip and shoulder finished thursday after new year's day and of course uh we're snowbirds so after my uh section we jumped in the car and headed down to our condo and actually on the way down, we stopped for the night and I actually lifted a light, a very light bag to hang it on a hook on a luggage cart and my shoulder began to bother me again. And uh, I felt great, but the shoulder continued to increase in pain. And so on last Tuesday, uh, I ended up in the ER in Pensacola and uh, they did a, a, a CT scan based upon where my, my, where my pain was you know, running down my neck, down my arm and my shoulder. And they found that there was a lesion on the vertebrae at your neck i don't know which one it is but if you put your hand back there you got that big bump back there uh there was a big lesion pressing on that that was pressing on a nerve which was causing my, my intense pain so uh we actually had called in and headed back to my oncologist in, in fayetteville my home port if you will on thursday and had an appointment on friday and we did an mri and confirmed that indeed that lesion was there and, and uh uh, and we, but we also found another one in addition to that one on my spine that is in the process of developing. So these two lesions uh, appear to be very similar to the one that we did a biopsy on in November. And uh, that particular uh, uh, lesion does not put out PSMA. And we're assuming these two don't either. And uh, the, the guess is they probably do not put out any PSA either. Uh, the one that did the biopsy on was 
pretty uh, the, the pathologist said if he didn't know it was prostate, he, he wouldn't have been able to really determine that. So I, I personally think it was already doing some migration to small cell or, or neuroendocrine. But anyway, all that said, uh, be, because everything looks like Plavicto has been working very well for me. Uh, and I've actually got a gallium 68 scan in the morning because we were getting ready to do my fifth uh, Plavecto infusion this week. But now we've kind of put that on hold. And because we got this very aggressive cancer that, that has already shown three, three lesions and we expect many more to be popping up, we're going to try to be much more aggressive. And so uh, we decided that, unfortunately, not my favorite, but uh, we, we do chemo and uh and put the plavecto on hold now the standard of care normally would be for me since i've already done those a little over a year ago would be cabazitaxel and carboplatin but one of the things i did do when i had my biopsy done in november we sent the tissue off to tempest as well as we sent it off to another company kind of new in the works called improbe which does proteomics and what improbe found was that my particular cancer was very, very high in expressing a protein referred to as TOPO2A. And uh, you do a little research on that, I did some Googling on it. And of course, that particular uh, protein, when it puts off in the excess, does cause significant cancer cell growth. So one of the recommend recommendations from that company, based upon what they found, they said that bazitaxel and carboplatin does not show to work quite as well when, when the cancer puts out that type of protein. But Another uh, chemo drug oftentimes used in, in, in lung cancer is, is atopicide. And uh, said, and it showed to, to work very, very well with this particular type of protein being put out by the cancer. And so we're going to actually add carboplatin to that. And I actually started my first three session dose today. I'll, I'll do today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. And then it'll be about four more weeks. And then we'll probably do another session. And at this point, I haven't had a chance to really talk in detail to find out exactly how many sessions we'll have over you know four weeks four weeks four weeks but uh anyway that's kind of where i'm at just want to give everybody an update that uh was was good news Plavecto's working but bad news i got these other cells that seem to have taken off in a big way and don't look too pretty one thing one thing you might want to consider um mike is sending that last biopsy slide to epstein and seeing if he identifies those cells as neuroendocrine, small cell-like cells from, from your last biopsy. It's not very expensive. You know, it's $250. I'm sorry? I have to see if we, can get, if we can get hold of that anymore. Like I said, we sent the template, we sent the M-probe, so I'm not sure uh, what they... Oh, what, you, what they you can definitely get hold of it. They return it, and it's it, it's there. But if he throws them, I mean, you know, there's nobody better in the whole world than than Epstein in terms of his eye and, and, and looking at genitourinary cells. And um, he may be able to throw some additional information. It may not, because if you're going to go with the atoposide and the, um, we, we've seen people do atoposide before, um, but, you know, atoposide and, and, and carbo and cab um, it's, it's quite a cocktail, but it's just it just just a thought that you might want to run those slides past him and, and see what he sees in them. Okay, I'll Doesn't see what I come up with. All right. It's very it's very uh, it's very exciting to see proteomics leading to uh, treatment decisions at this stage. Right. So explain to us protonomics, Dr. John, please. The, the, uh, the um, you know, a lot of, a lot of what we do. Sorry, guys. It's proteomics. Oh, thanks, Herb. A lot of what we do is uh, addressed to the DNA. And DNA uh, chemistry is pretty advanced. Uh, it's errors in DNA that cause our cancer, and it's changing DNA around the androgen receptor that's at the center of a lot of our treatments. But uh, as you probably have heard, we've been, DNA um, 
has the job of making RNA, which has the job of making the proteins. And now we're seeing RNA di diagnostics quite a bit recently. You've been hearing about that. But surrounding the DNA is a whole bunch of influential uh, proteins. And um, these have some effect on the uh, expression of the DNA, including in cancer. And uh, it's an early field, um, but uh, understanding that third level um, of, uh, of prote proteomics is already, sounds like to me, already leading to uh, informed treatment choices. Mm -hmm. It's pretty. It's pretty cutting edge. John, yeah. Can I, can I, put my two cents in? Oh, I hope so, Herb. Thank you. So, proteins are the things that actually do the work, right? Yep. Your DNA is your DNA, and that becomes RNA, which then becomes coding for the proteins. But the proteins in the cells are actually the business end. They are the ones that your androgen receptor is a protein. All of the business molecules that work are protein. And so the level of protein expression, as well as their sequence, determines their function. But it's really the, the proteins are the key because they're the functional elements. They're the business end that actually does the job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Sophia, did you want to add anything to that? Must have stepped to, oh, here she comes. Sorry, I'm not sure if I, my audio is working. I keep yes. cutting in and out. Yes. I'm sorry, would you mind repeating that for me? I said, would you like to add anything on, on protonomics? Um, I, I unfortunately am not sure about that. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I mean, Are you it, it your is. Chat window, Sophia. What was that? Are you checking the chat window? Yes. Good. Um, I mean, you know, this is really what Sophia was talking about before, which is how testing can. Um, can help us identify the right drugs. Um, in this case, the TOPO2A, which may be responsive to atoposide, was identified through the protonomics. Um, and now there are tests like the like the new um, the new test that that um, Myriad is bringing out. Um, which identifies both RNA and DNA, but then we've got yet another level. So a lot of this, you know, this field is moving so, so quickly. And, and kudos to Mike Yancey, who had had, I think, an FMI test and, and, and then took it up to the next level by going to Tempus to do yeah. test yeah. RNA. Yeah. And, and, um, uh, can you mute, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, going to Tempus, who test RNA, and then going to um, uh, this other company whose name I forget, sorry, Mike, um, who test protonomics. And bingo, we come up with something that, that may point to... Um, to using an existing drug, and I mean this—this this is the um, epitome of personal medicine. You gotta love it. Anything else on that uh, fascinating story we just heard? Uh, I'm going to move on to Steve. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Steve. Um, how are you? Good. I just had a crazy question. Uh, for those of us that are metastatic, hormone sensitive, and Ron Zytiga, 
in Lupron, and our PSA is undetectable. Um, Pat Martin and I talked about this, but my doctor also says, let me know if you have pain or anything new. And my question is, I have, you know, arthritic pain through injuries from sports and things. Is there a simple answer to what's the difference between bone pain and arthritic pain? I mean, is bone pain just more consistent? I tell you, I, I'd love for Herb to take a shot at this one. If Herb, are you with us? Yes, I'm you with talk? you. I'd love for you to take a shot on this one because this is exactly what you've just been through, right? <laughs> right. I mean, basically, we couldn't figure way. it out. Right? It just vocalizing the sources of my pain was just an immense work. And we couldn't figure out. Ultimately, we decided that it was not cancer. I mean, we had ruled out the radiation. The spot radiation didn't do anything. And then other things didn't do anything. And so we decided it, it was not likely to be cancer. And I, I, I've asked that question time and again of every doc I spoke to, and nobody could answer straight. <laughs> so That's the what I was afraid is, of. It's not easy. What? For those that have bone cancer pain, would you say it's a more consistent pain or is it? I'm, I'm just curious. I, I don't they know. always ask me. Okay. You would think so because bone cancer pain, for example, my pain went away when I was in certain positions which took pressure off of my spine. But I'm not mm -hmm. sure bone cancer pain would do that. But I'm not sure. I'm saying this not out of knowledge. Okay. And that, that's really the only question I had tonight. So so you are having pain with a non-detectable PSA and you're you're wondering whether to worry. Is that right? Yeah, I mean it's my pain I think is uh I mean I I'm seeing physical therapy and uh it goes I still do a lot of activities at ski and all that stuff. But I just was wondering cuz they, every time you go in their their office or talk to them, they're always like, "Well, how pain." And I'm like, "Well, you know, arthritis arthritis wise, you know, I'm in pain, but and nobody's ever been able to give me a good answer on the difference." So, yeah, anyway, I just thought I'd try. Tonight. No, and I'd like to ask anybody. I mean, guys, I think a lot of you have, have faced this issue. Is it cancer or is it bone pain? Any Anybody else in the group have anything you want to say on that? We'd love to hear from you on this one. It also yeah. ties right into the fear of recurrence that we all walk around with all the time. You know, anybody else mm -hmm. gets an ache and they pass it off as old age or I walk too much, but every time we have anything, we think, oh, this is a metastasis. Yeah. Yep. I don't know. My, my doc had said that, uh, you know, bone pain, she described it as continuous, unrelenting, you know, change of position, change of posture, you know, no, nothing, nothing makes it better other than pharmaceuticals. That's, that's how she described it. Thanks, Dr. Bob. That's a good answer. Thank you. Anyone else? Hey, Rick, this is Julian. Yes, Julian. I, I've had bone pain, but it, you know, it only happens at night. And, and that's when I go to the bathroom and then come back and it, I feel the bone just really hurting. But after a while, it just subsides. But what I've learned to do is exercise uh, with weights as much as possible to abate that. And that seems to have taken that pain away over a period of time. But initially, it was almost unbearable. But, you know, as I lay in bed, it would slowly subside. But I, I didn't focus on it because it, it seemed to get worse if I focused on it. Then it slowly just subsided and 
and I dreaded getting up to go to the bathroom again because it would come back again. Mm -hmm. Well, Julian, that was like me. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think that it's highly unlikely, and again, we can't give you medical advice, but from my own experience, and maybe the other guys would comment if they, if they want to on this, because it's a really important topic, that um, from my experience, it's rare to see significant bone pain if you have um, a fairly low or early level of metastasis. It, it's more likely to be there when the either the metastasis is very, very extensive or you've been living with that metastasis for several years. Um, you know, in prostate cancer in particular, uh, it, it tends to be an issue that, that happens pretty late in the disease. Not always, but, but mostly late in the disease. Um, one of the problems with prostate cancer, when it metastasizes, it frequently does go to the spine. And when it goes to the spine, as we know, because we've sadly had men that we've seen even in the last 12 months or so who have had um, spinal mets, um, it can cause a lot of pain because it affects the, the, the nerves in the spine and that refers to various places in the body. And so, you know, that's a lot of times why we see it, but it, it's, it's not something we see that early in the game. It's not something we see that, that, that early in the game. I don't know. Dr. John, you want to say anything on that? Uh, not only that, but I have been pleasantly surprised by, uh, I mean, there there have been a, a, a fairly large, looking at it the other way around, there's been a lot of men in this group with known um, bone metastases who don't have any pain. And yes. uh, I think if if we applied the various hints and suggestions that we've heard to Steve's situation, the chances of him suffering pain from metastasis sounds very, very low, doesn't it? Yeah. Of course, yeah, we can't no. make a diagnosis, but we certainly can say that you don't need to be frantic about this. Uh, the the other side of the coin is guys that haven't been diagnosed yet and spend a year or two with chiropractors getting strung along or or physical therapists and find out they're getting no relief and find out lo and behold they've got uh, bone meds they've got prostate yes. cancer didn't know yeah. it yeah yeah a, a huge issue and 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 you know um, I, I'm not sure how much time we have. But, but it is a perfect segue for me to make a comment here, Dr. John, which is that if you read my um, reminder this week, um, I, I am just grossly offended by the way that the American Cancer Society spun the numbers around prostate cancer. I mean, I, I find it amazing. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm gobsmacked. Um, they reported in the, as a headline that cervical cancer had, had reduced as had many cancers, but prostate cancer had increased. And then you looked at that and, and you looked and you said, well, prostate cancer increased from 2014 to 2019 at 3%. You say, okay, yeah, well, you know, that, that's significant. But what they didn't tell you is what's happened since 2019. And from 2019 to 2023, prostate cancer has increased at 16%, one six, 16% per annum. It is astonishing. And nobody's commenting on this. And that's the ACS's own numbers, but they chose not to highlight that, which, which I think is, a, is scandalous. That's the first thing. The second thing is a lot of those 
and now it's starting to get more and more press and you you've heard it here for for the last year or more is that a huge percentage of these men coming be, being diagnosed these new diagnoses are metastatic which is exactly what Peter, peter's point that he just made so you have these poor guys who haven't been diagnosed with prostate cancer they probably never got their psa tested and they suddenly find not only do they have prostate cancer but it's gone to the bones and it's pretty advanced because it's giving them pain now acs needs to pull their bloody finger out on top of this i'm getting into a i'll use an english expression i'm getting into a barney i'm getting into an argument <laughs> with his with his his lordship dr otis brawley i hope he listens to this and dr brawley back in the day because he was the chief medical officer um from i forget when 2000 and 12 i think or earlier until 2017 i'd have to look at my numbers um dr brawley was was always opposed to prost to psa testing now he says and he said to through howard walensky to me today oh he wasn't opposed to that he just thinks that um shared decision making should be used for prostate for psa testing do me a favor the ACS is about preventing cancer. I don't have a problem with shared decision making, but shared decision making doesn't come into PSA testing and preventing cancer because PSA testing is only about information. And since when do we have to have a discussion about information? Now, what we do need to have a discussion about, and I, again, Brawley needs to take this to bloody heart, is that what the ACS should have been doing is talking to the practitioners about how to use that information from the PSA test so that so many of our men who didn't need treating didn't get treating. And what does this Putz have to say? He says he's devoted two pages in his new book about me and... Um, patient advocates who get the wrong end of the stick. I'll tell you who's got the wrong end of the stick here. It's bloody Otis Brawley and the American Cancer Society because they were talking about shared decision-making when they should have talked, been talking about everybody getting a PSA test, everybody, and then handling that PSA information in a sensible, correct way so that men did not get over-treated. Hmm, exactly. And I am angry, and you can hear. And when I got this message through through Howard from Brawley today, that he said that he's taking me to task, and I don't understand it, and I don't get it, my response to Howard was, bring it on. I'm happy to debate this with, with Dr. Brawley in the press. These bloody epidemiologists don't understand what's going on on the ground. Back in 2012, he should have slated the USPSTF for telling men not to get not to get treated. 288,000 is what we're looking at this year. And of that, maybe 56,000 are going to be metastatic. And for me, I put that right at the feet of the ACS and people like Dr. Brawley. And what does Brawley say about support services, which the ACS cancelled? Oh, it didn't have anything to do with him. He was just on the medical side. He was making, I believe, I could stand corrected, he was making a million and a half when he was there, along with jo John Seferin. He was making more than John Seferin. And between the two of them, they couldn't get it together to provide support for prostate cancer, to advise men to get PSA tested, to do something, to step in on our behalf with the USPSTF. You guys don't hear me get on my soapbox that often it's rare but boy did this is it, it, it this is big and it's going to get bigger and i'm still waiting for the acs i'm still waiting for pcf and zero you know the elephants in the room in our prostate cancer i haven't seen them say anything about 16 percent a year can you imagine if breast cancer was going up at 16 percent a year
It'd be in the White House. That's it. Sorry. So, so Rick, while you're on that soapbox that goes right along with it, why are the why are the primaries not doing DREs anymore? I asked my primary before you know before I had my prostate. Can you check my prostate? I don't do that. You need to go to a urologist. I'm not doing that. Jeez, oh man. So he's he's gone, you know. Sorry about that, Joe. <laughs> It just came out. <laughs> hey, Rick, how, how, how would you how would you respond to the argument that, you know, it's a matter of demographics and an aging baby boomer population? It would have an abnormal, a, a much different, you know, outcome or statistic than breast cancer. Well, first of all, I don't know enough breast cancer, but I do know that breast cancer gets diagnosed frequently in older women. It's not necessary. We hear about it a lot in younger women, but it also gets diagnosed frequently in older women. We have, a, I, you know, I, in, with, res, with in the greatest of respect um, to, to personal information, we actually have a gentleman on this call today whose wife just got diagnosed with with breast cancer. So I don't know. I I, I cannot make the comparison. Um, as far as the impact of um, the aging population. I mean, that's a good epidemiological question, but maybe you can post to uh, Dr. Brawley because he should be an expert in that one. But I got to tell you something. I, I honestly cannot believe that we can attribute a rate of increase between 2014 to 2019 and now 2019 to 2020. 2023 from 3% per annum to 16% per annum to the baby boomer population. I mean, that's my gut. I don't have the evidence. I'd have to research it. But I think, yes, it's a factor. But I think the much bigger factor is that men have not been getting tested because their doctors don't test. I had a doctor who didn't test me back in 2007 because he thought it led to to overtreatment, and I went from two to ten in two years, and I and I was diagnosed. Thank God, not thank God, not with 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 um, stage four metastatic, but I was I was diagnosed with with stage three metastatic outside the capsule at 56. Perhaps we can find out what Schultz thinks about this on the uh, Monday the 30th. Send your questions. That's Send your question questions, everybody. I'll, um, we'll move on, but I'll put, the, uh, I'll put the registration link for Schultz in the chat window right now. All of you have it in your, you all have it in the reminder, and you can send a question to Joe Gallo, Joe G at ancan.org. And um, you know, and uh, and I encourage you to do so. Rick, as long as you got the floor, would you like to announce about Cal? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. yeah. Um, and, and I think this is an example of um, yeah. You know, it brings a lump to my throat. I wish Dr. Brawley was sitting in here with us so that he could hear this. But um, a lot of you remember Calvin Z, I'm sure, um, from being in these groups. He, the last time he was with us was earlier this month. He was complaining about hip pain from his Pluvicto. And I heard um, that he'd been in the hospital for the last few days. And Marty Chikoyan, who's in his support group, his physical support group in Seattle, told us this morning or yesterday morning um, that he passed away, which came as a huge shock, certainly to us moderators. And Cal, God rest his soul, was, um, was diagnosed in um, March of 20, age, age 66, de novo metastatic. PSA of 92 and five plus five. How did he get? How did he get to 66 without a PSA test? 
Dr. Brawley, how did he get to 66 without a damn fierce agent? Hope you listen. And God rest his soul and may his memory always be a blessing. He was a good man, as many of you yeah. remember, um, treated at Swedish in Seattle and his poor son never had a chance, did he? Never had a chance. No. Five spots on his vertebrae when he was, when, when he was, and in his skull, when he was diagnosed. That's why I get upset. That's why I'll take Dr. Otis Brawley on anywhere, any place, and argue with him that he doesn't get it and he's missing the boat. And we as advocates do get it. And we don't have to be concerned with, 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 um, with the medical ethics to say what we need to say when we need to say it with the greatest respect to the doctors and the dentists who are on this call today. Rick, I had, um, I had a doctor tell me, um, I, I used to get tested regularly and then for, uh, the last few years before I was diagnosed, I had a doctor tell me it was not recommended. Um, and I, I saw a different, um, GP who said, I, I'm going to test you. Um, and that's when they found it. But if they would have kept to the testing they had done before, they would have caught it sooner. And I know another man, exactly the same thing where they told him, um, not necessary to, uh, to test so regularly. And he wound up, um, de novo metastatic. And John, me too. Uh, me too. <laughs> Jim Marshall. I had like no prostate test for over 10 years. And then all of a sudden it was 300. Well, all of a sudden I ended up like some kind of achiness under my leg, by my hip. It kept getting steadily worse day by day. And I went to a, well, through a lot of stupid shit before someone finally did like an MRI. And I had real hip pain, serious. And it, oh, my PSA was 200, whatever. And that's how I found my prostate cancer. You know, I sometimes think, that, don't know what, what would have happened. Wonder if they could have saved it and caught it while it was still inside the prostate. Mm -hmm. Don't know. But, you know, you know I, it's a terrible situation. I, I, re I remember back in the day, in the early 2012, 2013 to 2011, sometime around then, um, and we were, we was, we were very, we were all very upset at the time about overtreatment. We knew it was a big, big issue. And the people, the people at UCSF were probably in the forefront of trying to um, reduce the amount of unnecessary treatment. And everybody, not everybody, but there was a lot of talk about it's too much PSA testing. And we said, no, PSA testing is about information, not treatment. And Brawley came to town and he debated my doc, Mac Roach, both of them African-Americans. And he said again, something that we'd heard him say before that he said in public, he now says he didn't say it, but there were a lot of people who, who heard this. He didn't want to know his PSA test score. And he felt he had a right not to know his PSA score. African-American man, mid fifties, doesn't want to know his PSA score. It's his prerogative, but in my opinion, that that's craziness. And the problem is that when you've got the chief medical officer of the ACS saying, I don't want to know my PSA score, how helpful is that? But we as advocates don't know what we're talking about, right? 
I it, hope it really that, wasn't uh, the overuse of PSA that caused the suffering. It was exactly. the resulting overuse of castration exactly. and prostatectomies. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move Go on. Come on in. Let's move on. Sorry, soapbox yeah. guys. Thank you, uh, David. You're looking a little horizontal there today. Yeah, I am horizontal. Just up. Um, but I'll sit. I'll sit up, so it won't be horizontal anymore. The uh, so what that I've wasn't been a complaint. <laughs> yeah, you know we talked about this a few weeks ago, but I've been I've been having a major uh, uh, colitis or Crohn's or proctitis attack. I don't want to call it an attack, but just a, a major flare. And um, I don't know what 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 are the other guys doing about it when 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 it happens to them. Because it's kind of been shutting. It's I'm good for two three days, and it knocks me on my ass for a day, or two days. And I get back up again, and been eating well, and uh, but it's it's been taking a toll on me, the past three or four weeks. Are you assuming this is radiation induced? Well, I think it is radiation induced. I mean, I had before I had uh, a prostate cancer. I mean, I had a pretty good case of Crohn's when I was younger, but it's been in remission for a long time. And, mm. and when I, when the radiation hit it, it just, it, it just flared big time. Mm -hmm. And uh, urgency is huge and don't want to be away from a bathroom. And it's been really hard on me, you know, going to the bathroom 18, 19, 20 times a day. Oh. That's tough. Jesus, David. So I'm just curious what other guys are doing and, and uh, just throwing it out there, guys. Well, anyone? Yeah, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I, I've been feeling it a little bit over the last two or three weeks from, from my own radiation proctitis um, or IBS, a combination of both, not to the extent that you have, um, more than normal. Um, what do I do when it flares up? Um, sometimes I try to change what I eat because I, I, my belief is that what causes it to flare is certain foods. And I just got to be more careful with certain foods. Yeah. Um, one thing is, have you, have you tried cutting out wheat, David? I haven't tried cutting out wheat, but I'm pretty, you know, I know exactly what, what, uh, what triggers it food wise. And I think it's both food and stress, but I, I, I don't eat really, I don't eat any wheat. So, I mean, but completely cutting out gluten because when, when I had, when I had the, before I had prostate cancer and, um, I returned from Romania to the UK just for a few months. And I was having really rough IBS. And I cut out wheat for about three months and it made an enormous difference. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if, I mean, you could try it. You could try it for, I mean, you know, corn is fine. Corn products, tortillas, that's fine. But try cutting out gluten and just see if it helps you. If you, it's easy to do. Yeah, try it for the next month or so, two, three weeks, and see if see yeah. if it settles your gut down. It doesn't aggravate your gut so much. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? But you mean you mean no bread, no pasta, everything, no wheat. Um, no, I mean yeah, bread and pasta are fine if they're not made from wheat. Because you could you you can get bread now that's non wheat bread. You know you can get corn and you can get rice. You can get other things. Same thing with pasta. In 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 the um, in in the supermarkets. But yes, I mean just cutting out cutting out gluten. Um, Pat Martin, you have a comment. Yeah, I use dicyclamine. 
I travel with it. I carry it with me. First time I I have a, any kind of touch of diarrhea, I take, um, depends on how bad it is, I'll either take one or two. And kind of hard to get started after you get it stopped, but I've got foods that I can use uh, from there. I know. Uh, say that again, Pat. What do you use? Tricycling? Dicyclamine, it's in the chat window, David. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Got it. David, Got you must it. have a gastroenterologist yeah. since you have Crohn's disease. I do. I do. And I've been talking to them. And, and basically, they're suggesting as of today to get back on 20 milligrams of prednisone to bring down all the inflammation. And I, I have a hard time being on prednisone. I get cranky. I get jacked up. I can't sleep. And uh, what about steroid suppositories so that you don't have to have your whole system? I'm, I'm doing those now. Oh, but I don't oh okay. Enough, I don't know if there's enough steroid in there or not. Doing those twice a day. David, I, I've had a number of students with stomach problems and, you know, they blame it on a lot of stuff. And I tell them, run this experiment. Cut out the wheat, right? Cut it out. Give yourself a month. And I'd say two out of ten come back and say, oh, my God, you're so smart. You're brilliant. <laughs> no, I'm not so brilliant, you know, and at eight, of course, we're saying, well, you're full of crap, but, you know, it does, it's an easy experiment to run. It yeah. really is. It doesn't Agreed. take that, that much. Yep. Thank you. So, so, David, I'll second and third that with the wheat, but I'm also, um, I just did number 25 of my radiation treatments today. Um, I'm doing an intestinal support complex which really seems to help and pepsin gi it's a, it's a it's a zinc and both of those seem to help i mean i got you know i got a little no, it's bothered me a little bit not much after 25 treatments so I think that's another thing you good. could do uh norm is go on not a low not a low gluten diet but a low fiber diet it's common oh, I'm, I'm having a problem. no it's low fiber diet is commonly used during radiation treatment to help people with uh, uh, diarrhea and stomach cramps I haven't I haven't had it hardly any of it is with taking these two products I see can you put the can you put the two products in the chat window for the benefit of David and others, please? Thank you, Rick. If you're gonna try to avoid wheat, is is whole wheat just as bad as any other wheat? Yes. 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 If the problem is gluten, whole wheat is just as bad as any other wheat. Um. Anything else for David? Thank you, Jen. Bob, you ha where's Bob? Let's see. Oh, there you are. Hi. You got something to bring up? Yeah. So, uh, Bob, thank you. Yep. Yeah. So my, my last chemo was October 24th. And so far, my white count is just not coming back. Um, so two weeks ago, it had been... 2.1, maybe 2.4, then it came back down. Two weeks ago, it was the highest. It was 2.9. That was two weeks ago. Last Monday, I saw the hematologist because yeah. I have EMGUS, a monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance. Um, small percentage of people with that turned into multiple myeloma. He didn't think that the plasma cells that are made in the uh, excess in my bone marrow was the cause, but it was, he said it could be a possibility. Anyway, last Wednesday, I got blood work again, and it was down to 2.1. Um, I did go last Wednesday for a second opinion at Fox Chase. I saw Dr. Gynisman. Um, primary reason I went is I'm a good candidate for Keytruda because I have MSI high and MMR deficient. Um, 
he basically agreed with everything my doc said, and he was pretty emphatic, as was my doc, that just wait, wait on that. Just, you know, save it for when you need it. Um, anyway, but since my PS, my white count went back down, now the hematologist is talking about maybe we better do a bone biopsy, a bone marrow biopsy. Um, even though my numbers are good, if I've got too much plasma cells in the bone marrow, that could be the cause. And if that's the case, then even though he said I wouldn't be considered having multiple myeloma, he would treat me as such. So uh, not looking forward to a bone marrow biopsy. So I'm hoping in the next two to three weeks, maybe the PSA, uh, PSA, PSA uh, my white count comes back up. Um, I don't know, has anyone had an issue with white count taking a long time? Now, Dr. Geinersman, he didn't think almost three months was too, too long to start getting too concerned, but, um, you know, it's a, a little disconcerting. Bob, did the new lab bring it up while you were doing chemo? So it, it did every time except for the last time. You know, I, I would be at one week after, I'd be like five to six. The last time it only brought it up to three and then it went down. It's been bouncing up and down, but it's been pretty much a straight line if you just, you know, average it all out. I mean, it's not terrible at two, but it's half of what it should be. So. So really, until any until that gets better, I'm in a pretty much a holding pattern. Uh, you know, fortunately the PSA has gone down, um, but you know, uh, not, I'm just you know waiting to see what happens. So I guess no, let, nobody's had. Let, uh, look up my stats after my chemo. How long it took me to come back. Thanks, Peter. What um, what uh, what particular white cells are suppressed, Bob, or is it all of them? It's pretty much all of them. The um, so my last one, the neutrophils were one, lymphocytes were zero point seven. I see. Um, you know when when it was at its highest, white count was two point nine, neutrophils were one point five, lymphocytes yeah. were point nine. So I thought, oh, I'm finally you know over the hump, and then it went back down again. So. Hey Peter, is Nulasta only good for uh, neutrophils, or is it more of a general white blood cell stimulation? Do you happen to know? I can't answer that. I'll have to look that one up. I, I, I think it's a, I think it's a general because when I was taking that, taking that, and it worked, you know, my everything went up. I see neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes. And then everything kind of balanced out. So, yeah, I mean, I feel okay, but you know, and I guess because of COVID, you know, walking around and uh, yeah, I only took there was only docetaxel, you know, Lupron docetaxel. So, okay, Bob, Just, Bob mine, yeah. I went as low as 2.5 for my whites um, after at the end of my chemo, and then it then it went into the threes, but it, it never got yeah yeah uh, one week post op I was 3.1, since then the highest it's been is 2.9, the lowest it's been is 1.7. Oh, it's mostly no, been right yeah. around two 2.1. Yeah, that's low. It it took me about. Six months to get back to the high threes. Yeah, so six months. Yeah, so I'm has anyone I... has anyone in the room had a uh, bone marrow biopsy that they could tell? I have. About? Um, I have, and um, Bob, I also have MGUS. I've never had chemo, um, but my white count is really low. Um, I have MGUS and mm -hmm. they want to do another 
bone biopsy. I had one a few years ago, and it was the first they were they were teaching this resident how to do it. It was his first bone biopsy. Ugh. And it hurt like hell. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. The guy was, uh, I mean, no question this was his first. Mm. Um, and I was the guinea pig. But now they want to do another one and they're not sure where to do it because I had pelvic uh, radiation. And usually the place they want to do it is from your lumbar spine. All right. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to give it another three, maybe four weeks. But I guess if it doesn't start looking better, that's going to be my next step. And hopefully I won't be looking at a whole nother set of uh, treatments for multiple myeloma. But OK, thanks. Yeah, so you, you want to. Keep, if keep they're going to do it, make sure the guy, it's not his first time. Yeah, he, he actually said that the hematologist said the his nurse practitioner actually does it all for them. And that you, uh, so. so, so let, let, me, um, let me come in here, Dr. Bob. First of all, um, God forbid you've got an issue with multiple myeloma or an MPN, we have a support group. And Can runs a blood cancer support group. We have a couple of terrific MM moderators, very well qualified. Um, yeah. They're actually multiple myeloma coaches um, my, through myeloma tree. Yeah. Really I'm not really good. looking forward for another support group. As you might imagine. I know you're not, but I'm just telling now. The reason I raise that also is because in the last session um, a couple of weeks ago, and I just put the uh, I just put the recording link in the chat window. There was several discussions about bone marrow biopsies, and they talked about bone marrow biopsies at some length, and some of those folks have had like 20 of them. So um, if you want to know more about bone marrow biopsies, we can, we can help connect you. I hope you don't, but we're a source of support for that. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, Rick, anyway, I attend that one, and that was a good discussion, and the bottom line said, knock me out. I don't want to be awake. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I'm. I, I've spoken to someone who had, and he said his uh, biopsy from his prostate was worse than the the bone marrow. But yeah, but we'll see what I'm happens. I'm sure you know, Bob. You got to wear a mask and really be careful. You know, I did my chemo during the height of uh, COVID, and I, I mean, I was freaking nervous when my when my blood, white blood went down to 2.5. You know? Oh, yeah. No, I, 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 they didn't give me new last of the first one. And my, uh, my white count went down to 0 0.8 and my neutrophils was 0 0.1. Oh. Uh, you know, oh. after that was um, the last step. So, yeah, no, I, I've got good masks and, you know, three years, almost three years, I haven't gotten COVID yet. So, good. So um, the, the other thing is um, that Dennis McGuire, who is not here today, has recently had bone marrow biopsies. Um, so uh, we, we can also connect you with him um, because they found evidence of prostate cancer in his bone marrow. Um, so we'd be, I'd be happy if you just reach out to me if you want to talk to him and, and I'll connect you. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'm going to give it a few weeks and hopefully... Uh... This whole talk will be super, superfluous, but I don't know. We'll see. We owe so. so. Is it an option to be put out for this? I'm going to ask. You know, unfortunately, yes. I, I, I have a uh, colonoscopy coming up, but a totally different department. <laughs> While you're there, take a vote. <laughs> a, two, a two for one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
That's All right. right. I'm starting to watch the clock now, so I'm going to move Go on. ahead, uh, Dr. John. Jeff with a G, uh, you're here after a couple months or something like that. Hello, Do you want to yes. up? Sure. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I need to go back to history or something, but um, <clears throat> so I'm about five and a half years after my uh, treatment, which was uh, radiation and uh, Lupron and Xtandi for two years um, for a Gleason 4 plus 5 prostate cancer. Uh, <clears throat> It's uh, the PSA has been this is a really good uh, topic for this uh, today's meeting, I think. But I mean, uh, let's see, for me, uh, PSA has been really low, but it's been sort of creeping upward, you might say. And I just wondered if this is a concern at all. Last uh, the last uh, last July and about six months before that, it was measured at. 0 0.20 and then I just got a result a couple of days ago that's 0.25 and I don't know if that's significant or of any level of uh, something to be worried about. Um, these are the highest numbers I've seen in the five years since I was treated. Doesn't sound too bad. You want to look for doubling time, and if it only went up half a point in uh, in six or seven months, that's not much of a climb at all. If you're down uh, in the point two range, so for isn't it, post isn't it uh, radiation, like... yeah, for radiation treatment, that kind of range is not is is to be expected, I guess. Or well, you still have a prostate, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not a doctor either, but in my my mind, I would not be too concerned. And, you know, I just keep an eye on it and watch if it starts doubling in, in uh, within two three months or something like that. Then you want to perk up your ears. But right. Sound. Okay. Well, my urologist said, uh, you know, at, after this length of time and such low numbers, I'm probably nothing's going to happen. I'm out of the woods or whatever, but uh, I hope he's right. <laughs> but us, we, I haven't none discussed of, the latest. None result. of us are ever out of the woods at least in nine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Isn't a yeah. doubling time of eight months or shorter considered to be more worrisome? And if it's longer than that, it's less worrisome. Do I remember that number from somewhere, guys? Mm, and you're right. nowhere near that. Okay, yeah. So he's saying I should I should get tested once a year at this point. Does that sound? No. I no. would feel no, better I, myself I, if I, it was more. Go ahead, Rick. I, 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 we're probably going to say the same thing. <laughs> go ahead, Jim. I don't think it's frequent enough personally, but I bet your urologist thinks your urologist thinks it's frequent enough. So what, six months or? <laughs> so, uh, first of all, are you uh, who, who's guiding you, Shinohara, at this point? No, this is uh, this is uh, Harry Newworth in Marin, right. North Bay Urology. Get, yeah, get, Marin. yeah. Do, do yourself a get, get do yourself a favor. Get yourself out of Marin Urology and go back to UCSF. I mean, I I happen to know that practice. I, uh, yeah. I know the doctor and I know some of the other doctors. They, one of them was a rowing buddy of, at, uh, at Marin Rowing. And I think at this point, what you what you should be doing, and, 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 and I, it's beyond me that they're talking about once a year. Um, I, I, I would say you were in that trial with Albert Chang and enzalutamide, right? Right. And who who delivered? Did Albert was it Albert that gave you the radiation or somebody? Or 
I can't remember. Uh, yes, Albert did the radiation, the HDR and, and all. Yeah. And who is now managing? Do, do you have a quarterback doc at, at, at UC at UCSF or not? Uh, well, uh, there was. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, the uh, I was trans. I was passed off. Uh, Albert Chang went to U, uh, UCLA, so I was right. palmed off on someone else who kind of dropped. Or I don't know. I fell through the cracks there, I guess, uh, and I got tired of trying to. Right. Who, you, the, who uh, was the who was the last doctor? Oh. Who was the last doctor at UCSF that that handled your Okay. Case? Well, I did go see. Ira Charlip uh, a couple of months ago in the urology, who I liked quite a bit as a person. Uh, do you know that name, uh, urologist? No. And I don't have any contact with the, uh, you know, radiation oncology or the okay. oncology I think what, area. I think right what, I, what I would recommend you do is find out who um, is the doc that is handling your case right now and in terms of the trial who you who right. you've been assigned to which radiation because it should be still okay. with somebody at radiation oncology and i, I believe the trial has been ended it was closed okay. with yeah. not enough Jeff, people Jeff, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa. <laughs> okay all right okay. i'm not looking for a long story here I'm listening. <laughs> it's, it's, there's somebody somewhere was passed your to your case, and the trial ended. Now you, you're still an open. You should still have open patient records, and somebody in radiation oncology should be assigned to follow you if needed, because that was the treatment that you got as part of the trial, along with enzalutamide. Right. Now, obviously, it's not going to be Albert because he's gone. But we need to no. find out who it is. And if we can't find it out, yeah. then we've got to go back to the navigator. You go through the navigator. Um, what's her name? Geronimo. Geronimo. Okay. Go back through Geronimo and say, I want to talk to this. My PSA is starting to climb. And I want to talk to somebody. And I wouldn't start with a with a radiation oncologist at this, uh, with a urologist. Unless you've got urological problems, you don't need a urologist. You need a radiation oncologist or you need a medical oncologist. And well, there are some radiation should be following you. There are some uh, urological aftermath problems from the radiation, but yeah. Um, I do have, there was a someone following my case, but I haven't talked to him in a couple of years now at this point. So I need to Who go. Was it? Okay, I'm blanking on his again? name at this point. He was a new guy there, okay. um, so okay. well, <laughs> I can I know I can dig it out though. That is that's where you want to go back to start. As far as the cystitis is concerned, yes, that is for <clears throat> for the urologist, but he's not going to pick up on your treatment, and you need to follow up with somebody on your treatment because. Yes, if it's crept up from 0.2 to 0.25 over the last eight or nine months, um, it's not a lot, but you need to be monitored on a more regular basis, and uh, Newarth is not the man. Okay. Okay, good. Um, I'll uh, take your advice and go ring them up. Yeah. Um, let see. Can't think of his name right now, but I I will as soon as we sign off. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. You can always write it in, and we'll look him up. All right. Uh, Jim Jeffries, I think I didn't get to you when I was taking inventory at the beginning. Did you want to bring anything up tonight? Uh, yes, I did, John. Thank you. Um, quick quick summary of my details. I was diagnosed in 2017 with. Um, um, Gleason, Gleason 10, did radiation, chemo, and uh, hormonal, and have been basically monitoring things with um, Eligard. I was on Eligard for two years, uh, 17 and 19, and then took a drug holiday. And then in 2021, 
through March of 22, uh, I was went back on the Ella Guard. Um, January, so I've been off since March, any uh, uh, drug holiday. February. Now on uh, January 23rd, my PSA, um, which always historically has been very low, um, uh, was a 0.23, and in June it was a 0.05, September was a 0.06. So if we talk about that multiplier, it's multiplied uh, uh, by three. Um, and my PSA, as I say, was always low. Uh, so my oncologist suggested that I go on um, um, alutamide. Um, and I was wondering, the Eligard did work well each time I was, was in that regiment. And can, can anyone react to why, uh, alpalutamide is, uh, is that now the, um, the preferred treatment? Yeah. Hello, come on, someone. <laughs> no, I mean, is it, how many folks are no, on? No, no, no. Uh, Jim, Jim, it's a great yeah. question. I'm waiting for somebody else to jump. We got enough guys who can answer yeah. this without my jumping in. Who, who wants yeah. to take it? Pretty common to take second line drugs. So it's not uncalled for. There's a number of them that work well. So right. um, now let's talk about now, let's talk about for Jim. Let's talk about the second line antiandrogens to to help him a little bit on here. Yeah, I use darolotamide and it worked well with me. Very few side effects. Okay. Same here. Okay, so Jim, uh, it's like getting blood out of a stone here. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Rick. There are there are several second line antiandrogens: ab abiraterone, um, apalutamide, enzalutamide, and darolutamide. Okay. Um, the ones that end in "ide," enzalutamide, apalutamide, and darolutamide, all block the androgen receptor. And they, the apalutamide and the enzalutamide are pretty much identical. It's, it's, it's tough to choose between them. The darolutamide is a much better drug, but it's harder to get. And the reason it's a much better drug is because it doesn't cross the brain barrier. And so you get, um, uh, your mental acuity is significantly better. So when you're asking what's the standard of care, it depends on your level of disease, number one. Number two, um, what we've seen is that it's best to use abiraterone first. And then um, to go to apalutamide or enzalutamide or darolutamide, that the trials seem to suggest that sequencing is better. Now, who is the oncologist that you are seeing? It's uh, Mark Chernoff. And, and yes, that aim rings a bell. Where is he? He's in Philadelphia. He's with, with uh, whom? Uh, it's called, well, they keep changing names. Alliance, Al Alliance uh, Cancer Center. Right. As and I've heard Chernoff's name mentioned before, but as you well know, we strongly prefer the centers of excellence. I think it's Chernoff, um, and maybe it's through you, but I don't seem to have any notes on you, Jim, which I can't yeah. believe, but I don't know what's happened to my yeah, notes yeah. on you. But um, Dr. Guinesman, I also went to for a second, and he conferred with... Um, with Dr. Chernoff a couple of years uh, ago. Right. I'd go back to Gainesman right now. 
is what I would do. Okay. And um, is Dr. Chernoff a Janita urinary medical oncologist? No, no, he's not. He's not. But I mean, the, the rapport has been been excellent. I think he's you know very proactive in taking my my. I have a good you know I have a good feeling. Yeah. With... But see, here's the problem. The rapport may be great, but he may be he may not be keeping up on the literature. So, for example, if do you have other medical, I mean, other than the sarcoidosis, do you have any other medical conditions? No. no. Fortunately, I guess. Okay. So, and as it so happens, because you have sarcoidosis, abiraterone may be a better drug for you, which one would hope Dr. Chernoff would recognize because it comes with prednisone. Uh oh. And as you well know, prednisone is frequently um, prescribed for, for sarcoidosis. You don't need it. Except it's at a lower level. It's a low. It's a low dose. Sometimes, occasionally, ten milligrams a day. Some more often, five milligrams a day. But the fact is that if you have sarcoidosis, and we're suspicious of you, um, and I don't know how low your PSA was originally, and this becomes a big issue. If you're a low PSA producer, you, yeah. you should be seeing you should be seeing Gainisman for your prostate cancer, even if you know you can go have a drink and 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 meet Mark Chernoff for a chat or go for a walk with him on a Sunday morning. But he ain't your right doctor for this disease. Okay. And and he ought to know, and maybe he doesn't because it's a nuance, that not all second line and uh, and anti-androgens are born equal. And the abiraterone, um, in most cases, unless it is not, um, it, it it it's contraindicated. For other conditions, the abiraterone is best to start with. So let me, with that said, anybody else want to make a comment on all of that? I would no, certainly uh, second what Rick said. No. The, 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 the other thing was we've talked about the PSMA PET scan. And because my um, PSA has always been low, um, speaking of that, would it be an appropriate time to do the PSMA before we go to another drug to kind of get an idea of what's going well, on, especially with the sarcoid? And okay, so I'm going to ask Alan Babcock to comment on that because Gainisman. Um, it, Gainisman is, is more flexible on that than a lot of docs. You know, we, we typically, we don't think you see very much, but if you're a low PSA producer, we may see something. It, it's hard to tell. I mean, you right now, where are you at? 0 0.06? Right now I'm at 0 0.23. Oh, you're at 0 0.23. Okay. Right. And I was traditionally for the last year or so, a 0 0.05 or a 0 0.06. Okay, so, so kind of, uh, point two three, Professor Babcock, go for it. <laughs> You're on mute, Alan. <laughs> ah, You're still Alan. on mute. Alan, mute. <laughs> You're still on mute. I'm Alan, mute yourself. I can't read your lips. You're talking too fast. <laughs> You can't get yourself unmuted, it looks like. Right. Come on, Alan. Let's see. Why can't we? Why Why is Alan unmuted? Okay. Keep muted. Unmute. We've sent you a request. I don't know. Whilst Alan's trying to figure out, we've sent him a request. We don't want him muted. And he's, he's, he's very... He puts on a good show, that Babcock. Yeah, I'll say that. nice, nice hand movement. 
Yeah. Alan, use your words. <laughs> Alan, use your words. Go ahead, go ahead, Norm. I was telling Alan, use his words. <laughs> um, well, while we're trying to get him, and uh, why, when you were saying that they want to do the apalutamide before the darolutamide, um, Dr. Eve puts most of her people on the, the darolutamide first. Right. Um, the reason for that is because it's a, it's a gentler drug, but it's very hard to get it. You have to be metastatic and hormone sensitive, and there's no evidence that Jim is metastatic at this point in time. So it would be very hard to get him the darolutamide. Now, Dr. E may be able to do it because she's a magician, yeah. but most yeah. drugs, most people cannot do it. Uh, most of the docs cannot. Gainisman may be able to get it for you. That notwithstanding, we do know that abiraterone works better before the uh, before all of the eye drugs. We do know that, but we also know that darolutamide is an easier drug to tolerate than than um, uh, than the other drugs too. Yeah, now I wasn't any of those, and she got me on it and got it paid for to boot. Okay, yeah. but she's not the unfortunate. Did you have the, side effects, Norm? Uh, hot flashes like mad. Okay. I wear zippered sweatshirts now, and as soon as I feel them coming on, I rip it off before I get soaking wet. <laughs> okay. But that's other than that, not much. Just yeah, just the, just the hot flash. And how long have you been on it? Uh, <laughs> I'm on my third bottle, so I just finished in my third bottle. Three months. Okay. And, but uh, I was within, within well, two weeks, I was having Alan's hospital. still going on. I don't know how we can. Alan, Alan, go out and come back in again. Sign out and come back in again. Okay. Looks like he's getting mad. <laughs> he is getting mad. He is getting mad. I, Look at I appreciate all your help, Alan. <laughs> if, if, if you can I can't lips, understand it. I, if you can oh. read lips, it's expletive deleted. Whoa! That was, I think I, he's I, talking I, to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Um, I suggest, but look, if not, yeah. I'll connect you and Alan, yeah. and you okay. can you Do, can talk. Uh, the urgency. I, sh I should there. I should really do my due diligence here before I uh, just say, okay, let's go with. Uh, yes, the, uh, definitely. Because, because if you're a low PSA producer, Jim, and if um, the disease has progressed, we want to see it on the PSMA. So that tells us where to go next. And, and so I, what I would do is try and get in to see Gainesman as quickly as you can. Tell them it's fairly urgent because your PSA is on the move, and um, and try and get in to see him. And don't don't necessarily start. You see, once you start taking that drug or both those drugs, it's gonna it may suppress your PSA, and we won't be able to do a PSMA scan. And, and just today I was reading that, that they don't seem to feel that there is a lot of adverse impact to wait on starting hormone therapy. So you, you, you may have some timing there. And, and, and again, this is a nuance that, that, that um, your man, um, whatever his name is, 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 is not sure going to recognize. Okay. Chernoff is not going to recognize, but but Gainisman will be familiar with that literature. There was something called the TOAD study, T-O-A-D, that they tried to show it, but they didn't have enough enrollment and they had to stop it, but there were preliminary results from it. Alan, get out. I'm throwing you out, man. You're out. And then you can come back in. He's probably told a great story, which I wish I could hear. Oh, Jim, that, didn't we just have somebody a couple of weeks ago that they were only like about 0.2 or 0.3 and had a 
a PSMA pet and ended that up was Alan. He had a, oh, okay. That was that was I Alan. That's why I'm trying to get him he, back in. <laughs> he did a he did a I don't know where he did a uh, mating dance or what or how he got it approved, but he yeah. They did. They did mine at point two, and that's exactly what the doc said. He said, "I just want to see if you got a little hot spot we can treat. If not, then we did the whole pelvis and prostate yep. bed." Jim, Jim yep. Jeffries. Yes, sir. Forty percent of men do see a result at point two, but about eighty percent of men see it at point five. So it doesn't mean you won't see it, but you, there's just a lot less chance of you seeing it. Okay. And I, I don't know. Uh, did Alan went away. Okay. Um, he he I, may I come know. back. I, I, I don't know I, how he, uh, how he made out with his or what the, what the finding was, but, uh, okay. I, I appreciate gentlemen, uh, your, your comments and your, I value your opinions. Thank you. For, Here, here's what we're going to yeah. do. We, we, we will, um, connect. Do you have Alan's are you in contact with Alan, Jim? No, no, I'm not. Okay, so I will. I'm gonna. I'm gonna put Alan's um, email. I'm gonna send it to you right now. Um, here it is. I'm gonna send it to you right now. Send him a link. Send him a note. And um, this is going. This is going to you only. Um, to Jim Jeffries and then reach out to him and then you'll hear from him to knowing Alan you'll hear back from him tonight okay <laughs> wow what, okay uh, well yeah. guys it's uh it's Alan's back oh is Alan back oh you're here oh there I he is my goddamn Damn. cursor <laughs> <laughs> well you were we were reading your lips right yeah without a cursor you can't do anything I got two things going here. Okay. Tell Jim. Okay. So tell just, Jim, tell Jim about your experience with. Right, real uh, quickly, Jim. Yeah. Keep it um, clean. He did it for me. I talked to him, and he said, "No, damn it, this is an aggressive cancer. We're going to go look at it." And he wrote some letters, and it was my commercial insurance. And they said, "Okay." They said, "If that's what you want to do, then that's what we're going to do." Okay, and, and did you have the results? Was that work out favorable for you or give you some good? Well, the results were inconclusive. <laughs> well, just like Rick said, I, you know, but um, but he did, he felt like he got some results, but I wasn't okay. quite as convinced as he was that it was that he got, you know, results because if there wasn't enough there and nothing showed up, there was a report and everything. But it was like, well, if there's not enough PSA there, there's not enough cancer there, it might say, oh, yeah, it doesn't look like a problem, but maybe the cancer is there. So I don't know if that helps you or not, but he he was really helpful. And his words to me is, damn it, this is, no, I didn't say that because I say that. He said, this is aggressive <laughs> cancer, all right? And Dr. Wong agreed with him. And he said, then we have to be aggressive and doing the PSMA is part of being aggressive. I just want to make sure that I'm going to get you know, negative results, and that's what he got. And he did say, this doesn't mean it's not there, Alan. It just means we couldn't identify it, so we're just going to have to do a general pelvic radiation, and, you know, we, we can't pin it down on anything. Now, Alan, you were just recently diagnosed, correct? Because Yeah, I had my prostatectomy uh, last February. I was diagnosed in... Okay, uh, so... But, you yeah. know, around last November. It's been about a year, little more okay. than a year. Excellent. Well, but but my PSA it. went up very quickly, and he he both he and Dr. Wong said no, you're at point two. I said you know I was said well couldn't we wait to go up so you could see if you could find the cancer and both of them said absolutely not. I mean Dr. Wong had a physical reaction to me, like <laughs> no fella that's not going to happen. Um, we need to do the radiation. So it went from what well went from zero five to uh, 0.16 to 0.2, and that was all. That's all Gainesman needed to see. Okay, that's back in favor. Thank, thank you. Well, I, I don't want to. Okay. 
And Alan, around, I, that's how, that's Alan I think I, I have your email, so I'm going to just uh, send you an email and maybe we can, uh, we can speak offline. I, you know, appreciate everybody's time tonight and I'm sorry so what, that, okay, I'm sorry. So which, which email do you have? He has what the right you, one. He has the okay. right one. I just sent it to him. Something that doesn't have your name in it, that's for sure. <laughs> it begins with a W I S E. Yeah, it's got like a nickname. That's what my wife calls me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wise guy. iCloud. So, yeah. Jim, that was my that's my exact same story. Almost the exact same numbers and the same thing. And 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 Dr. E, nope, you're gonna do the radiation and the and the ADT. And that's what we did. Okay. Yeah, and he did ADT with me too. In fact, we're just about ready to finish it up at the end of February. Okay. And then we'll really see what the truth is. Okay. So yeah, feel free hey, to email guys. me. I'm a retired man, so I'll get right back to you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll get to you. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for your comments and assistance tonight. Yeah, my apologies for not getting that damn cursor. I was so pissed. Yeah, I wish I could read your lips. You were really going on there for about five minutes. But <laughs> he was cursing yeah, at the cursor. Sometimes. <laughs> so, all right. Right. All right, guys. I'm going to wind it up. Thank you all for coming. And we'll Thanks see tonight. you next time. Thank you for those of who are left for bearing with me on my soapbox. <laughs> Good night. Thanks, Thanks Dr. Good night. John. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.